I can visit Mauritius. Um, oh, but I'm in Bangalore. I'm in. Oh, okay, in Bangalore. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so I believe we've opened it up now to other participants. Hello. Hi. What? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah we have a lot, of, a lot of other people joining now. Fantastic. Hi, Lee. I think uh, the, uh, could you, can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry, Andre, you, I, I lost you. You were saying something and my internet went a bit unstable. No worries, no worries. I hope that you were, I thought you were in Mauritius, but it seems like you're in a different uh, site. <laughs> I thought you were, <laughs> oh, you're a headquarters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen now. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Okay, I think we can get started. We have a number of people who have joined us. Thanks everyone. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, I say good morning. I'm coming from uh, New York, so it's quite, quite early in the morning. Um, but thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, if I could actually ask uh, my fellow panelists to mute their microphones, um, everyone else should be, should be muted automatically, I believe. Um, my name is Lee Tomford. I'm the UN Women Coordinator of the Promoting Women's Economic Empowerment in the Indian Ocean Rim Project. This is a three-year project supported by the Australian Government, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or DFAT, uh, and it's being implemented in collaboration with the Indian Ocean Rim Association. Uh, so this webinar is actually part of the project's series on the UN Women, UN Global Compacts, Women's Empowerment Principles, or what we call WEPs. Um, so before we get started, I'd just like to briefly share our agenda for today. Uh, we're happy to have two guest speakers with us, uh, Mr. Andre Siragar, who's from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, and Ms. Nalanjana Biswas of the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers. Uh, so today's webinar is expected to last for just one hour. Uh, we don't have much time, unfortunately, but we hope to leave some time for questions and answers at the end. So you're welcome to send in any questions for the speakers during the webinar by using the Q&A tab that you should see at the bottom of your webinar controls, uh, or you can raise your hand during the Q&A session and I'll um, unmute you so you can share your questions. Um, I'd like to mention that today's webinar is being recorded, so uh, we'll be sharing the recording with you in the next few days. So today's webinar is actually going to focus on promoting uh, the WEPs and women's economic empowerment in fisheries in the Indian Ocean region. This webinar actually coincides with the launch this week of our project's report on women's economic empowerment in fisheries in the blue economy of the Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, this report was developed in partnership with the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers and analyzes the roles and contributions of women in this sector in the 22 member states of the Indian Ocean Rim Association, or IORA. For those of you who are not familiar with IORA, it's an intergovernmental organization aimed at strengthening regional cooperation and sustainable development within the Indian Ocean region. So in addition to advancing women's economic empowerment, they actually aim to grow the blue economy in a sustainable and inclusive way with a focus on fisheries and aquaculture also among its six priority pillars. Uh, so our report actually attempts to fill the gap in data, which is a pretty large gap uh, and lack of knowledge on the challenges and opportunities for women in the fishery sector. Um, and the report provides a series of recommendations that are directed towards both uh, state and non-state actors. 
So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the WEPs, I just wanted to provide a very quick overview. Um, this is a set of seven principles and they offer guidance to businesses on how to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in the workplace, in the marketplace, and in the community. Uh, the WEPs were established by the UN Global Compact and UN Women, uh, and they're informed by international labor and human rights standards, and they're grounded in the recognition that businesses have a stake in and responsibility for gender equality and women's empowerment. So the WEPs are actually a, a vehicle uh, for corporate delivery on gender equality, uh, dimensions of the sustainable, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the 2030 Agenda. So by joining the WEPS community, the CEO of a company actually signals their commitment to this agenda at the highest levels of the company. And they're basically uh, staking their claim that they're gonna work collaboratively in multi-stakeholder networks uh, to, to foster business practices that actually empower women. So these, could, these practices could include such things as equal pay for work of equal value, gender responsive supply chain practices, or maybe even zero tolerance against sexual harassment in the workplace, among many other different uh, initiatives that can take place. So actually, as of today, there's over 3,600 companies around the world that have committed to implementing the WEPs. And this includes 456 companies that are based in IORA countries, in the 22 member states of IORA. Uh, the highest number of WEP signatories uh, within that region are actually found in India now. Um, the United Arab Emirates, Australia, and South Africa uh, have the highest number of WEP signatories at this time. Um, but please note, if you're not from a company and you're attending the webinar today, um, the WEPs were designed for the private sector, but other actors such as governments, NGOs, fishing collectives, unions, academia, on and on, they can, you can still serve as allies of the WEPs and adopt this framework for your own actions to advance gender equality and women's empowerment. Um, also, the WEPs are not possible um, without considering that uh, it's up to governments and local governments, regional, international bodies to create an enabling environment to support the implementation of the WEPs uh, by the private sector, such as adopting gender responsive policies, laws, regulations. UN Women and UNDP recently launched a COVID-19 global gender response tracker uh, which actually reveals the lack of gender sensitive measures in place in countries around the world to protect women against the social and economic impacts of COVID-19 and that the social protection and jobs response to the pandemic has largely overlooked women's needs. So there's a real continuing need to, to mainstream gender into policies, uh, particularly economic uh, recovery responses. Uh, as we all know, women are being particularly hit hard by the pandemic. Uh, especially women who are working in informal employment. Uh, and I think we'll hear from uh, our speaker, Ms. Viswas, that uh, many of the women engaged in work in the fishery sector are working within informal employment and are most likely very hit hard by this pandemic. Uh, women overall as well, their unpaid care and domestic responsibilities have increased uh, with uh, COVID-19. And this uh, restricts their time even more so uh, for paid work or to be able to advance in their sectors or to participate in decision-making bodies or leadership positions. So today, it's even more important to have a full picture of the realities and the challenges and the opportunities for women working in fisheries so that the policies being created now in the face of the pandemic can equally benefit women and address their needs. So without much further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, Mr. Andre Sirigar, who is the Director for Asia Pacific and African Intra and Intra-Regional Cooperation at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. He's speaking with us today, representing Indonesia as the coordinating country for fisheries management in Iora. Uh, so we've invited Mr. Uh, Andre to provide us with a brief introduction to Iora's approach to fisheries management. Uh, Mr. Sirigars, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to now try and get your presentation up. Excellent. Okay, go ahead. 
please. Right. Um, uh, uh, first of all, thanks so much, Mr. Leigh Tomford, for uh, inviting me, uh, not only Indonesia, but also uh, uh, um, uh, chair for the CGFM in Iora. Uh, a pleasure to be here, and uh, also a pleasure to meet with you, Miss. Uh, 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 and also, uh, more importantly, um, for me, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the issue of women economic empowerment is is not only uh, crucial for us in Indonesia, in various forums, in APEC, in IORA, in, in uh, PIF, and various regional forums, but especially for Indonesia, where 250 million people, uh, all, uh, uh, just, just above half of that are women. And, and for me personally, I have three daughters and one son, so I have a, a vested interest to make sure that uh, women economic empowerment continues to be promoted. But this topic that you have raised with the element of fisheries is very, very timely because right now through IORA, uh, we are also uh, progressing uh, more uh, faster in the, not only in the blue economy, but also those fields which are um, very, very pertinent to uh, many member countries of IORA, especially in fisheries man management. That's why uh, earlier this year, uh, Indonesia um, uh, established, uh, introduced a, uh, the cluster group on fisheries management and uh, in collaboration with the IORA Blue Economy uh, um, Core Group. And uh, the purpose of this being is that um, the blue economy is such a vast uh, area for cooperation, but the uh, fisheries management has a lot of uh, um, uh, practical uh, areas that need uh, immediate attention. And, and, and much of that is to do with the role of uh, uh, empowering women. So um, as we launched the first uh, meeting of the CGFM on the 23rd of June, uh, uh, the member states have been consulted and they're in agreement with the concept note and the term of reference of such a CGFM, and it which is based on the, uh, the leaders declaration in 2017 when Indonesia uh, hosted the first uh, IORA summit. And, and uh, the, uh, this area is, is quite important for our, our member countries to, to look into. And not just that, we'll be hosting a, uh, advancing sustainable fisheries management uh, webinar on the tomorrow uh, to see uh, how we see this as a whole. But this topic of empowering women is is very pertinent, um, and because it's something that, um, as you mentioned earlier, this COVID nineteen has impacted um, uh, 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 the women's uh, economic role. As you know, in Indonesia we have endured several economic crises in ninety eight and in two thousand and eight. Um, in ninety eight was the Asian financial crisis. It was the women's uh, informal sector that kept the economy afloat. And even in 2008, when the world economy was uh, hit by a crisis, uh, uh, informal sector is the one that uh, kept our economy afloat and, and most of that were women. And even during this COVID times, um, uh, the digital economy is, uh, is uh, thriving with the role of women, but still uh, we need to continue to uh, facilitate their engagement. If I may go to the next slide. Um, I've mentioned earlier, uh, that we're conducting a few uh, events. Um, um, and in this discussion, I'll be uh, sharing with you uh, these four points here about the CGFM in general. And, uh, but more important, I'll be sharing on the Indonesia's fishery sector and how we want to empower the women uh, in, in that area. Uh, next. Um, and I mentioned earlier that uh, I went straight to it. Um, we conducted the first CGFM and we're, uh, we're planning to take it even at more uh, uh, formal level with all members of the IORA and more importantly to invite uh, various uh, uh, dialogue partners, not only uh, France and the US and perhaps uh, especially Germany and many other uh, dialogue partners, including Korea. Next. I think uh, if I may uh, share for Indonesia, uh, three quarters of Indonesia is uh, is the ocean, and and we note that our GDP is still modestly uh, based on the fishery sector, uh, even though it's quite significant at 420 trillion Indonesian, uh, but that's only about 2.6% of our national GDP, and and uh, and yet at the same time we're the world's largest producer of capture fisheries, uh, fisheries industries. Uh, uh, it is a key pillar for our economy and our food security, but. Uh, we note that um, we still have a lot to do to close the gender gap, how to enhance women's economic empowerment and how to strengthen indigenous leadership in suitable fisheries and drive economic development for women, and especially how we play a part uh, uh, active role or hosting the Coral Triangle Initiative of the uh, mm -hmm. Coral uh, Reefs and Fisheries and Food Security in Manado. So next slide. Again, uh, going very fast so that we can have more discussions. Uh, Indonesia's uh, women's role in fishery sector is um, quite uh, significant, despite uh, still um, 
uh, we're striving to get them more uh, officially uh, recognized. Yeah, they handle the selling process of the captured fisheries of 64% uh, of the market. Uh, they process the captured fish of snacks and food, 83%, and they cultivate fish at 74.5%. So um, their role in the industry uh, is is um, is vastly understated, and and the women entrepreneur is still very very modest at 6.6%, uh, while they play an important role in uh, uh, producing added, added value and, and other areas in the fishing industries. One thing uh, of all the fishermen in Indonesia, uh, we have fisher women uh, contributing at 4.4% of the labor market. Next. And um, so while we do that, um, um, we also note that uh, do women dominate marketing and processing of captured fisheries products, uh, 1.5 to 1.7 times higher than men. So their role is uh, very, very significant, and that maybe it's traditional roles that uh, 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 hold them back, or the fact that the fisheries industry itself is probably still a male-dominated area, and um, and yet uh, their role is very, very important in the industry itself. Uh, next, <clears throat> and so uh, to to overcome this challenge, um, we are currently still facing with several challenges, including the role of small-scale fisherwomen. Uh, uh, undermined by uh, undermined and un uh, marginalized, uh, fighting to be acknowledged as fishers, and uh, and as we pursue uh, gender mainstreaming policies, uh, we want to enable women to gain roles and benefits from fisheries industry. And um, at this point, uh, we have growing 400 independent marine training centers to empower women to uh, be more involved in food, uh, fish processing. But again, uh, it's still um, it's still a long way to go. Uh, but uh, through Ayora, we hope to. Uh, not only uh, garner Indonesia's national interest, but to also bring more collaboration in the IRA region. Next. And so with that one, um, in, in Indonesia, in collaboration, the Foreign Ministry and the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection, uh, we, we strive to continue uh, to promote gender mainstreaming with the mission to optimize the use of marine fisheries resources uh, by increasing added value and competitiveness of Port Mer marine and fisheries products and maintaining the carrying capacity and environmental quality of marine fisheries resources uh, for the uh, for women to understand. Uh, next slide, please. And in doing so, uh, I took note of the uh, the principles that you have introduced earlier. Uh, I can probably go straight to it to say that um, we have um, focused on uh, principle number two and Indonesia is trying to identify the same treatment of women uh, Fisher men with a Kusuka card uh, or a business card initiated by the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries. It is a way to uh, identify one in the marine and fisheries business actor. So uh, uh, you're acknowledged in APAC, it's probably called an ABAC card, but uh, hopefully with this Kusuka card, uh, it'll become more uh, publicly understood that uh, these are actor, these women are uh, important actors in the uh, fisheries industry. Uh, next. Also, uh, Indonesia is promoting the principle three, um, ensuring the health, safety, and well-being of women and men workers, but also principle four, promote education, training, professional development for women. And to do so, um, we are promoting and improving safe and healthy and fair working conditions of fishing vessels, personnel that includes in capture fisheries, aquaculture, and fish processing activities. And uh, again, that's one of the main objective in the a core group on fisheries management work plan uh, of Iora. So through a series of capacity building and training activities, uh, we hope to develop a minimum standard and Iora commitments of safe, healthy, and fair working environment to capture fish on captured fisheries, aquaculture, and fish processing activities. And also we wish to prevent and combat forced labor and modern slavery in the fishing uh, operations as one of the activities. As you know, fishing um, modern slavery is, is something that is still quite uh, prevalent uh, given the fact that um, some regions are still needing to be governed and, and um, by having this commitment, at least we are educating uh, those involved in the industry to know their rights and, and when it does happen, they can quickly contact their uh, Indonesian embassies or consulate generals. Uh, next. Um, again, Indonesia is also pro striving to promote principle five and that is to, uh, to implement enterprise development, supply chain and marketing press marketing practices that uh, empower women. Uh, the ministry, again, uh, through uh, Badan Layanan Usaha, um, uh, an empowerment uh, body, we are uh, preparing for uh, business service entities. Uh, we have uh, dedicated a, a total funding of uh, 3 trillion uh, rupiah to provide capital assistance to fisher, fishermen's spouses. 
for doing business in the fishery sector. Again, so not only uh, are we uh, empowering those who wish to to uh, take the mantle of becoming a fisher women, but also the most important role of uh, the spouses uh, uh, must be attended to. Uh, next. And um, and so for the way forward, those are the things that we are conducting in Indonesia. But by pursuing a CGFM, we hope to have greater collaboration and a, a regional uh, awareness of this. And as you know, Indian Ocean Rim has a vast uh, territory of uh, sea and a lot of uh, marine and fisheries uh, collaboration, uh, not only between member states, but also dialogue partners and the private sector. It is hopeful that we can, we can uh, harness our understanding on this and share best practices and even uh, explore uh, focused policy and uh, financing for the women. Uh, and at the end, to achieve a tangible result in advancing our fisheries sector is, is something that we're uh, pushing forward through the CGFM. And, and we hope that as we uh, progress through the CGFM, uh, our women will also be uh, beneficiaries of this uh, uh, campaign. I, I hope that was uh, helpful. Uh, I'm sure more than happy to share ideas. Thanks, lovely. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for, for sharing so much uh, really important and interesting information in a very concise, uh, a very concise, uh, brief way. <laughs> you pretty much summarized uh, some really in interesting initiatives. Um, I really take note also of the you mentioned the significant role of women in fisheries uh, in Indonesia, but also the low number of women entrepreneurs. I think that also kind of you know reinforces the fact that we really do need uh, supportive policies, uh, also access to finance uh, in order to enable women to uh, increase their entrepreneurship, uh, especially considering the value that they're already inputting. Um, and also, uh, I took note of the marine training centers and, and you're, you're highlighting the importance of training and, and mentorship programs uh, for women to increase their leadership roles and also their, uh, you know, basically their representation and decision making bodies. Um, and uh, I found the Kusaka card is very interesting because uh, I know Nalanjana, her research and what she'll share uh, really does show that uh, women are just not recognized and they don't have uh, ID uh, and they're not then able to access uh, benefits, uh, pension, all of the things that we need, particularly in, in times like today. So uh, thank you so much for sharing that. It actually provides a nice context uh, for our next speaker. Um, Nalanjana, do you want to see if you can go ahead and share your screen now? Sure, I'll try and do that. Okay. Uh, let me just introduce you. Uh, Ms. Viswas uh, is an independent consultant on gender and fisheries. She's been associated with the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers, or what we call ICSF, since 2007. And she's the editor of ICSF's Yamaya newsletter on gender and fisheries. Uh, she also served as our lead author on the UN Women Report that's launching this week, which we're really excited about. Uh, this report on women's economic em empowerment in fisheries in the blue economy of the Indian Ocean Rim. Um, so we're, we're really grateful that she's here with us today. Um, yeah, okay. <coughs> You're all set? Right. Thank you so much, Lee. Can you hear me? Yes. Am I audible? Okay. Yes. Uh, so hello everyone and I hope uh, you have all been safe and well during these uh, challenging times. I'm very happy that we are here together today and I look forward to your active participation. Last year, on behalf of the International Collective in Support of Fish Workers, my colleague Ramya Rajagopalan and I completed a baseline study for UN Women that Ali talked about. We analyzed data from 22 countries in the region, in the Iora region, and made certain recommendations. The report was then reviewed and validated by member states. I would like to share some of the key points of this baseline report. And um, we will start with a brief introdu introduction. We'll cover some important features of women's work, the proportion, their proportion in the workforce, types of work they do, the challenges they face, and their economic returns. We'll discuss some of the key recommendations we've made. And um, since this was a pre-COVID uh, study, the impact of COVID will be briefly discussed. I'd like to clarify that the, the women's empowerment principles um, were not used in the baseline report, 
But today, I will refer to the WEPs and draw out possible linkages wherever it makes sense to do so. So, um, between, um, in the decade uh, between 2006 and 2016, the growth in fish production in the Iora region was nearly twice that of the world's in the same period. Fish Fisheries is a vital source of uh, food security and cheap protein in the region. It is also a significant employer, supporting millions of fish workers. The, the Iora region is, however, highly diverse, with as many upper middle and high income countries as lower middle and low income ones. The level of technological development of fisheries is different in these countries, and with it, the employment opportunities available for women and men are also rather different. Now, uh, in this slide, we look at women's self-employment in uh, the Iora region. Now, globally, out of the total numbers of women who work, 44.3% uh, are self-employed. The, the ILO classifies self-employed work as vulnerable employment. The baseline study that we did found that the majority of IORA countries have a higher proportion of self-employed women than the world average of 44.3%. In this slide, we see that most of the countries tend to be bunched in the top left of the graph. This indicates low wages, and a high proportion of self-employment. This suggests that women across sectors in, this, in these countries face poverty and poor regulation of employment. That is, poor wages and poor levels of livelihood and social security are the defining features of their work. The baseline report classified countries employing more than 5 million fishers and fish farmers as high employment countries. As you can see, these are Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, which together hosts 78% of the total population of the region. In as many as 50% of the Iora region, there is no data available on women's participation in the sector. Even in countries where we do have some numbers, these seem to underestimate women's actual participation. Now, what I mean by this is that the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, estimates that women make up about half of the total harvest plus post-harvest workforce. However, we found country estimates to be as low as 7.8% in Bangladesh, 27% in India, and 37% in Indonesia. Only the data for Thailand seems to conform to the FAO estimates. The scarcity of data and the anomalies in the data that's available does raise serious, do raise ser serious questions with respect to existing policy and governance in the fisheries. Next, we turn to what women actually do as fishers in the Iora countries. Women in traditional fisheries perform multiple roles. As you see in this picture, not just women, but children too are pulled into the work. In the next few slides, we will briefly discuss the types of women of, of work that women perform. We will start with the traditional uh, fisheries. Traditionally, men have been viewed as fishers and women as active in post-harvest roles. This is a bias that influences most government thinking regarding the fisheries sector. The baseline study, however, suggests that in many Iora countries, women also play a significant role in harvest. For instance, they use hooks and lines, scoop nets and traps in Malaysia. They harvest seaweed in T Tanzania, catch or culture shrimp in Bangladesh. They spear octopus in reef flats in Madagascar, as this picture shows. The fish caught or gleaned could be for sale or for home consumption, contributing to local food security. 
In this picture, we see women gleaning for shellfish in South Africa. Now, the biggest challenge for women in the pre-harvest and harvest sector is the fact that their work is not recognized as work. As a result, it is invisible, unregulated, and subject to risk and uncertainty from a rapidly changing external environment. The fundamental challenge, therefore, is to recognize such work as work. The women's em empowerment principle number seven, which talks of measurement re and reporting, is of significance in this sector. The next sector in traditional fisheries is processing. The largest numbers of women across Iora countries work in post-harvest fish processing. They sort and clean fish and other aquatic products. Processing also involves low value addition methods such as drying, smoking, salting, curing, fermenting, often in highly unsafe conditions, using makeshift and inefficient technologies. Women's self-employment in post-harvest is full of challenges. Distant ports and harbors are replacing traditional fish auction sites. Inland rivers and lakes face pollution and encroachment. These factors directly affect the women's access to fish, as experience shows in many Iora countries. Fish loss is another challenge. In Comoros, for instance, post-harvest losses are estimated to range between 30 to 40 percent. Women in post-harvest lack access to credit. They are forced to resort to informal sources of credit at very high interest rates, or, must, or they must depend on traditional or informal arrangements such as fish for sex. Occupational health hazards from unsafe processing, tenure vulnerability, and poor regulation are other key challenges in this sector. This is an informal sector, and therefore, it is of vital importance that work in this sector be recognized as work. The women's empowerment principle, principles of note in this sector would be two, WEP2, which talks of gender discrimination at work, WEP3, which talks of employee health and safety, five, which talks of strengthening supply chains and marketing practices, and WEP7, proper measurement and reporting. Women in large numbers across the region also find work as fish vendors, selling fish in markets or door to door. Fish vending is another poorly regulated sector lacking formal recognition. Women in this sector face livelihood loss and uncertainty as their traditional market spaces are taken over. They lack access to good credit. Their access to both fish stocks and fish markets is poor. Transport, whether to procure or sell fish, is another big problem, as the struggles of fisherwomen in Kerala, India, have demonstrated. This sector, too, is an informal sector and must receive formal recognition. And women in this sector must receive an identity as fisherwomen. The WEPs most applicable to this sector would be WEP2, which seeks to remove gender-based discrimination at work. Five supply chains and marketing practices, and WEP7, which advocates proper measurement, reporting, and data collection. Now, women's waged work in fish processing and other, fact in other sectors sustains families and communities when traditional fishing is undermined by competition, man-made conflict, and environmental degradation due to climate change and disasters. As traditional fishing is eroded, women are often forced to migrate to distant centers within the country and even across national borders. Migration significantly increases the vulnerability that women face. Though women's waged work constitutes formal employment, it is poorly regulated and poorly paid. Women are confined to low technology, low paid jobs. Their jobs are often contractual in nature, lacking social benefits and protection. Whether South Africa or Australia, occupational health in factory based processing work is a matter of serious concern. In certain Iora countries, 
for example, Thailand, women migrants make up the bulk of the fish processing workforce and constitute a vulnerable and easily exploited section. All the WEPs are relevant and applicable in this sector of work. However, immediate action is needed with respect to WEP2, uh, treat all men and women fairly at work without discrimination, and WEP3, employee health, well-being, and safety. Now, irrespective of the type of economic activities they may engage in, women shoulder the major burden of domestic and care work. One study found that women spend three times as much time on unpaid care and domestic chores than do men. Now, the lack of essential services and infrastructure, such as housing, transport, health, education, and so on, greatly intensifies the burden of domestic work. The fisheries in the Ayora region are dynamic and rapidly changing and subject to competition from other economic sectors as well as from environmental impacts. The small island countries like Madagascar, Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles, tourism is vital to economic growth and employment generation. However, most women in the tourism sector are confined to non-standard and low skill jobs and earn considerably less than men. The lack of child support and uh, transportation and the irregular hours of work constitute real challenges for women in this sector. Trade in fish has also a strong impact on the fisheries sector. 70%, for example, of Bangladesh's uh, export-oriented shrimp processing workforce consists of women. At the same time, the expansion of export-oriented processing leads to declines in traditional fish processing and trade. In some places, it has impacted domestic fish availability and hence local food security. Studies suggest that the European Union's fish trading agreements with several African countries have had negative impacts on local populations. Employment is also affected by climate change and environmental degradation. The effects of climate change are being felt in all Iora countries, but for small island developing states like Comoros, Madagascar, Maldives, Mauritius and Seychelles, the prospects are particularly grave. Our baseline study covers the effects of climate change in the region and its impact on women's lives. We see, for instance, how the loss of coral reefs and mangroves in Mozambique, Tanzania, Indonesia, Sri Lanka is significant and, leading, and, and is leading to livelihood loss as near shore species disappear. Sometimes conservation measures aimed at environment protection can also jeopardize women's access to fish. In Comoros, authorities banned women's gleaning activities as part of a conservation measure. And in Bangladesh, climate change threatens to seriously impact fish availability a grave hazard in a country where fish constitutes 58% of the total animal protein consumed. Now, the Iora region has witnessed a rise in industrial fish and aquaculture production. While this has opened up employment opportunities, the employment is precarious in nature, and particularly so for migrant women and children. In Thailand, where fish exports is a major employer, decent work in the context of a large migrant workforce constitutes a serious challenge. So far, we've looked at the types of work women in fisheries in the Iora region engage in and some of the challenges they face. We now turn to the wages and economic returns that women in the sector receive. Estimating the economic returns to women in fisheries in the Iora, challenge, the Iora region was a challenge. Countries do not collect data on the fisheries separately, let alone data on women in fisheries. The fisheries sector is usually clubbed with agriculture and forestry. Given this situation, in the baseline study, we have assumed the agriculture, forests and fisheries wage, that is, the rural sector wage, to broadly represent what fisherwomen earn. This assumption is likely to be a valid one, given the evidence that women and men work in several sectors of the rural economy alongside fisheries. They also participate in other agricultural activities, 
throughout the year. The, this slide looks at the gender and sector wage gaps in, the, in some of the IORA countries. The gender wage gap indicates a comparison of women's wage and men's wage within the rural sector. The sector wage gap compares women's wage in the rural sector, that is the agriculture, forestry, and fisheries sector, with the average women's wage across all sectors of a country's economy. This slide indicates a fairly significant gender and sector wage gap in most countries. Women fishers are often at the bottom of the heap in terms of economic returns for their work. Figures for gender and sector wage gap that seem particularly high are indicated here in bold. For instance, for Indonesia, the gender wage gap is 44% and the sector wage gap is 61%. While for Thailand, only the sector wage gap appears high at 64%. For two countries, the Maldives and the United Arab Emirates, the gender and sector wage gap is negative. That is, the women's wage is higher than the women, men's wage in the sector. And women's wage in agriculture, forestry and fisheries is higher than the average women's wage across all sectors. We can discuss the reasons for this when we have a discussion if, if you're interested. Now, we uh, next turn to the consequences of poor regulation. We've seen that um, the majority of the fisheries workforce employing women is poorly regulated. Now, we've also seen that most women in fisheries are poor and self-employed. Their work is the backbone of the fisheries, contributing to the famous resilience of uh, fishing communities and to every country's GDP and national food security. Fishery policy, however, fails to recognize women's work as work. Fishing is defined narrowly in terms of the act of fish capture by boat or vessel. By this definition, women's work remains outside the pale of formal recognition for policy regulation. Even when women move into formal employment in fish processing factories, a sweatshop model is followed. Poor regulation results in poor economic returns, poor working conditions, poor social security. This in turn leads to poor health, which in turn reinforces poor economic returns from the sector. Sound and e effective policy intervention is desperately needed to break the cycle which keeps millions of women trapped, denying them the opportunity to realize their full potential for economic and other forms of environment, of, um, uh, of empowerment. Now, what happens when women's work is invisible? When women's work in fisheries is not given due recognition, this has a reinforcing effect. Women are undercounted or overlooked altogether in official statistics. This lack of data allows gender-blind policymaking to continue unchallenged. As a result, sectors that heavily employ women are underfunded. Starved of resources, women's work is further marginalized and discounted. This cycle too must be urgently broken and women's work in the sector must gain the value and dignity that it deserves. We now turn to the recommendations of the study. Our first key recommendation is for the protection of small scale systems in fisheries and aquaculture. The Iora region faces a significant challenge in ensuring policy coherence among its blue economy priorities. As these blue econ economy priorities often represent deeply competitive interests. The small scale fisheries provide employment, and food security to millions, in addition to an efficient and environmentally sustainable growth. This sector, therefore, is in need of special protection and support. The lack of formal recognition of women's work and identity is the basis of their exclusion from fisheries policy and schemes. The formal recognition 
of women's work as work across the fishery supply chain should therefore be a priority and women's needs should be central to the formulation of fishery policy. Better wages, better working conditions and social security are critically important important for women's economic empowerment. We have seen that women fishers are to be found at the bottom of the heap in terms of economic returns for their work. Policy and regulation must address this gap. Capacity is equally crucial for women's economic empowerment. Capacity enhancement should enable women to improve self-employed work and access better jobs in the formal sector. Access to resources would encourage women to take on entrepreneurial roles. Capacity would also help promote women in leadership and representation in all parts of the sector. The report recommends the urgent promotion and implementation of gender mainstreaming across the board. Gender mainstreaming needs to go beyond improving women's capacity. What is needed is an enabling environment for women's economic empowerment through sensitizing communities, employers, civil society organizations, policymakers, and implementers on gender equality. Next, there is an unacceptable lack of data on women's contributions and roles in the fisheries. The collection and dissemination of sex segregated and, and sector segregated data in the fisheries is a priority concern. Research on women's work across the fish value chain should inform fishery policy. Research should address technology improvements for women in harvest and host harvest. Research should also address workplace safety in order to reduce the burden of occupational health. Next, despite the fact that women and children are often disproportionately impacted by natural disasters, the climate crisis, wars and conflicts, we find that mitigation strategies often leave women out. Mitigation and rehabilitation policies and strategies therefore need to keep women at the center to also ensure the stability and revival of communities. Finally, the report urges for an alignment of international and local conventions. All IORA countries should ratify the various international conventions on women's rights and the report details these out. And they should also be ensured that their domestic policies and legislation are aligned with the priorities of these conventions. This study was completed before the, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic has significantly upset the economies of the Iora countries and increased the challenges associated with women's empowerment in the region's fisheries. Iora countries are reporting huge supply chain disruptions, with news reports suggesting that women in fish supply chains are facing a major livelihood crisis. The pandemic reveals the particular vulnerability of migrants who were stranded away from their natural support environments. Their experience underscores the need for strengthening conditions that reduce the need for forced migration. The pandemic has also demonstrated the perils of globalization, for example, and revealed an over-dependence on Chinese markets, as is the case with Australia and many other parts of Iora. It has underscored the need for a safety net to protect vulnerable populations, such as small-scale fishing communities. Existing occupational health and safety concerns are now further exacerbated by additional COVID-related concerns. The enforced lockdowns and the requirement to shelter in place has led to reports of increased domestic violence. Clearly, the pandemic has thrown up a new set of challenges, which the baseline study obviously does not capture. The new situation will need to be assessed separately for each country and for the region as a whole. The past Finally, the past two decades suggest that the recurrence of COVID-like pandemics is a possibility that the world will have to live with and that fisheries policy will have to address. COVID cannot be seen as a one-off event. 
with that, I'd like to thank UN Women, particularly Lee, for organizing this webinar and for this opportunity of sharing the findings of the baseline study with you. I would also like to thank each one of you for taking out the time to participate in this session. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Nalanjana. This was really, it's, I, I, I mean, there's so many challenges facing uh, women in this sector, but I know that there were many challenges facing you as a researcher as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, I, I, I realized that with the lack of data, it's, it's very hard. And it's also a very, very diverse region, the Iora region. So it's, it's hard to come up with uh, policy recommendations and, and make kind of overall uh, suggestions when it's such a diverse situation. But at the same time, some of the, some of the issues facing women in this sector uh, are some of the issues facing women in any sector, like unpaid care work and uh, informality. Uh, women are often carrying the burden of, of many of these challenges, no matter what sector they're in. So um, thank you for sharing the results and we're really looking forward to the report coming out this week. Um, it looks like we have two uh, questions here. Uh, Okay, um, re uh, request to share the baseline report. So that'll be coming out this week uh, on the UN Women website. So we will make sure that uh, it is received. Um, we had another question um, from Thomas uh, Krimmel. Can you please, uh, this is directed towards you, Nalanjana. Can you please explain the anomaly that women get much higher wages than men in the fishery sector in Maldives and UAE? I think this is probably the um, the rural combination of fisheries and agriculture. Um, we have that question. Um, uh, I can go ahead and read another question, or would you like to address that one first? Uh, I think you're on mute. Yeah. No. Mm -mm. You're still muted. Bottom left. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, oh great. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what happened. Um, so uh, what we found is that Maldives and UAE uh, show this negative uh, gender and sector wage, which may be explained by probably the fact that it, both these countries employ fewer numbers of women in the fishery sector. And the, these women, the fewer numbers of women who are employed are in um, high paying roles, in uh, bureaucratic roles, in, uh, as um, you know, entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs. They are not to be found in the fisheries workforce in quite the same way as women appear in other countries. And, and so uh, this would, uh, um, this is our, uh, you know, assumption. Okay, thank you. We also have uh, another question. I believe it could be answered by either one of our speakers. Um, there appears to be a conflict between many elements of the so-called blue economy and the livelihoods of traditional fisher folk, including women. However, Iora seems to be promoting the blue economy. Is this justified? Um, can I can I take on this, uh, Lee? Yes, please, please. Um, and and I, I really appreciate that comment. Uh, and and uh, before that, uh, I, I want to thank Nilanjana for the very very uh, comprehensive presentation. It gives me light on uh, which uh, area which I need to uh, promote in this as a chair of the CGFM. And as I mentioned before, I have three daughters who are uh, is of interest to me how they uh, progress in their career. I'm even. Uh, uh, speaking in my daughter's room, who's a Harry Potter fan, uh, with uh, with uh, their their uh, appreciations. But I guess, uh, and these are the appreciation that not all women or girls uh, experience. What the girls experience in the West, uh, even in Australia and uh, and and in in the U.S. But also, I've I've felt in the past three years being in Iora, there's a lot of uh, divergence in in uh, in needs, as mentioned by Nilanjana. A third are LDCs and. And if, if some are wondering 
the technicalities of why some women get more money uh, in UAE or in Maldives, uh, I can say for a fact that um, when Iran or Sri Lanka, all those other Iraq countries speak, chairing a discussion on even the blue economies is quite a, a, a vast endeavor. And that's why we focus on, on the CGFM because we know that the a core group on fisheries management uh, can discuss uh, uh, many things, especially are you fishing? And also now you've uh, brought to my attention the role of women uh, in, in the fisheries area. Uh, the blue uh, economy working group is still ongoing. There are many elements because uh, uh, of the 22 uh, countries involved, they have differing backgrounds and, and priorities and especially resources. And I wanna thank Mark from Australia, uh, the director and Iora who's uh, facilitated this activity. Uh, uh, your Australia's role in and, and uh, women empowerment in Diora has been very, very in inspiring. I think what we should do is, uh, in London, if you'd agree with me, is that uh, there, are, there are some elements uh, that we can promote in, in, in women uh, uh, economic uh, um, uh, principles empowerment uh, uh, in the Iora uh, based on some uh, um, uh, immediate priorities uh, uh, in the short term, especially. Uh, one thing is um, in the role of fisheries, I, I think um, when our governments can now be brought to attention, especially during this COVID time, uh, the important role of women. I think um, my foreign minister has always been promoting the empowerment of women in various sectors, uh, Lee, be that in the peacekeeping uh, operations or even, uh, even in empowerment in, in uh, conflict areas. And I think uh, the fisheries is no different because the fact is um, they're pretty much a backbone of our economy when things go really bad. And for Indonesia, that's very evident uh, during this COVID uh, uh, like I mentioned before, they play an important role in the digital area. And I think um, the digitalization of uh, women in fisheries sector might be a, 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 an option to pursue. Because at this point, uh, uh, the institution will always say, oh, we've got limited resources. And I felt that, and they've been saying that. And I'm sure that Mark will agree with me that the, the Iora region is so vast. Uh, where do we begin? And yet, if we keep on waiting, uh, uh, which one's easier to accomplish, the role of women uh, will be sidelined. So. Um, as, as, uh, as, as I don't think that uh, um, the blue economy should overrule the uh, fisheries management or, or all those other activities that we're pursuing, I think um, with this seminar, uh, with this webinar, uh, it made us realize that if there are some low-hanging fruits that we can empower women in the I.O. region uh, through the fisheries uh, discussion, especially through digitally, uh, digital communications, I think that would make a great breakthrough. I was already thinking about encouraging uh, my team to establish a special women women empowerment in the CGFM and utilizing uh, digital digital uh, technology for people to be more aware. Uh, I'm sure that most people don't realize this, how important they are in, in Indonesia, uh, how they contribute to the, the fisheries industry in which we hope to pursue. So one thing my president wanted to pursue was an Indo-Pacific cooperation on infrastructure and connectivity. And that connectivity is not only infrastructure, but also connectivity of mind and paradigms and uh, frameworks. And I'm thinking, uh, I think through digital uh, uh, technology uh, platforms and also empowering or encouraging more women to speak up and to share their experience, I think this greater awareness might uh, uh, at the end uh, produce the necessary uh, bump uh, for the, the bureaucracy to change. And, and, and that's what I'm hoping would uh, occur at uh, through the CGFM to work for. But I think the Indo-Pacific is not merely a discussion on strategic or security or, or all those years, but if we can promote uh, COVID collaboration with women empowerment through the Indo-Pacific, that might be a good, uh, a, a good momentum for us to pursue in the next, uh, in the next decade. Hmm. Um, could I add to that, Lee? Please. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I think uh, the, the, the question is a very uh, relevant one. Uh, because we see that the priority pillars of the blue economy, the six priority pillars of the blue economy, are actually uh, could be in contestation and are in contestation. So the growth, for example, of seaports and shipping or tourism, offshore hydrocarbons and so on, may significantly pollute and degrade uh, marine uh, ecosystems. And so uh, at the same time, there are economic development objectives to be met. So clearly, a, a coherent policy is needed, which means active engagement, which also means that uh, the risks have to be properly ascertained. And the fact that uh, large capital can lock out small players has to be acknowledged. Otherwise, uh, the empowerment of women will remain uh, sort of uh, just a goal and will not be able to be, we will not be able to put it 
in practice because women will continue to be confined to the lowest jobs in the uh, in the fisheries and uh, provide sweated labor so uh, i think the problem is very well understood by the small scale fishery guidelines which recognizes that the small scale fishers are in need of special protection now women can only be empowered if the sector itself is in place and is strongly supported so first and foremost the small scale fisheries need need to be protected and need to be supported and within it women's roles need to be identified and empowered and this has to be championed by people like you andre if i may say so thank the you quote one thank you great uh i'm very conscious of time here unfortunately i think next webinar we need to make it an hour and a half that's my recommendation well, i can imagine uh, lay it must be 3 a.m in new york isn't it or in brooklyn uh, it's uh, uh, your fisheries time is different <laughs> 4 a.m <laughs> 4 a.m that's where, when the fishermen uh, enjoy their their the catch but i'm happy that my baby hasn't woken up screaming and crying so yeah. it's a it's a success from my side um <laughs> we had maybe just one more question mark i'm not sure if your question was answered here um uh, many of the recommendations focus on steps each country can take. Were there any examples of regional cooperation or sharing lessons between countries that the speakers are aware of? Andre, I think that you were maybe just suggesting that there should be. Um, I don't know if either one of you have any kind of uh, responses to that, that you're aware of, of regional cooperation or lessons between countries. I think I think I think briefly, if I may, uh, lay before uh, uh, time runs up. Uh, and, and Mark mentions uh, clearly uh, India, Indonesia, and Australia. We're working closely on various uh, trilateral cooperations. But I think from the presentation that you and uh, Nilanja uh, Nilanjana mentioned, I, I think we're very modest in our uh, uh, achievements in empowering women. And and it's really opened my eyes that um, uh, we're actually focusing more on the fish than we are on the women. And that does it's not supposed to be like that. Uh, the are you fishing and and uh, making it more productive, and yet these are the silent workers that are the backbone of our economy. I think, I think there are some uh, bilateral and uh, trilateral cooperation, but I think it's uh, it's it's it, it is shared probably to be reflected in Nilanjana's uh, research and how we can make it progress further. Because the problem with the regional cooperation, uh, there's a lot of uh, overlap, and but when it comes to the statistics, uh, um, I think a bilateral or multilateral is more evident. And and I think Nilanjana, I think this is where regionalism really need to. Uh, harness itself and maybe if women uh, development can be uh, the topic of that that would be very very good absolutely i agree we have some um, networks of women in fisheries uh, uh, but uh, not at a, at a state level i'm not um, i haven't come across any um, such initiatives just just briefly if i may lay i think nilanjana i think we also should remember that Iora can not only engage the uh, national governments, but also the provincial governments. And I think, Lei, that is something that uh, we have been ignoring, the role of those states or provinces. Um, they play an important role, and, and all sometimes they would uh, uh, defer to what uh, the capitals would say. But the reality is the Iora region, the, all those uh, coastal uh, states and provinces play a greater role. And I think our next discussion, Lanjana, should be how they can contribute individually. Right now, we have the Indonesia and uh, India is Andaman and um, uh, 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 the Andaman and Nicobar cooperation and the state governments there are, are promoting more collaboration. I think we should throw in the topic of women empowerment also and I'm sure that Australia through Western Australia can play a role and, 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 and see this new uh, habit of getting bottom up approach uh, will be more effective to protecting uh, the women compared to getting a national consensus and getting some uh, regional output. Great, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, I think we are running a bit out of time. I just wanted to share my screen here. It has some uh, information. Uh, I apologize to those of you who submitted questions that weren't answered. Uh, I'm leaving my email address there. 
Um, I'll also share these questions with our speakers. Uh, perhaps we could get back to you with answers. Uh, I think most of the questions uh, that were remaining uh, addressed the issue of the challenge, uh, perhaps for a regional body like Iora to come up with policies that uh, in, in considering that it's such a diverse region with such uh, diverse economies and, and challenges. Um, so, but uh, I'm sorry, in, in the interest of time, I think we need to wrap it up. Um, I just wanna thank uh, both of our speakers for taking the time to join us, uh, Andre and Nalanjana, it's been a real pleasure. Um, I also wanna thank all of the participants who joined us today uh, and for expressing their interest in learning more about uh, women's economic empowerment in fisheries and also in the WEPS. Um, if there's any company uh, online who's interested in learning more about the WEPS, uh, we'd be happy to share further information. There's also the website there. There's a new website, uh, www.weps.org. Um, I also wanted to share uh, very briefly, there is um, a uh, awards going on and I apologize to those uh, online who are not from Asia Pacific, um, but this is a specifically a UN Women 2020 Asia Pacific WEPS Awards, uh, and they've extended the deadline until October 5th. Uh, so this is actually part of the We Empower Asia program. It's funded by the EU, um, and it is for um, all Asia Pacific countries, and it's uh, highlighting uh, best practices in categories such as leadership or youth leadership for those of us under 30, um, gender inclusive workplace or gender responsive marketplace, community and industry engagement, and also COVID-19 action. Um, so this is a, is a real opportunity to showcase the work that your company is doing um, to further gender equality and women's economic empowerment. Um, I'd also, before we uh, sign off here, I just wanted to um, launch a very brief poll, if possible, um, just to gather some information on, uh, let's see here, on this webinar, um, uh, particularly um, to request that you provide us some information on how our future webinars in the series can best meet your needs. Um, it would be really uh, very much appreciated if you can just take a quick look at these questions. Is everyone seeing them? Andre and Alanjana, can you see the poll? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Although Nalanjana host and panelists can't vote, so uh, I have to get my daughter to uh, look into it again. <laughs> Sorry to exclude you. I'm assuming you already know about <laughs> these topics. Okay, to those of you who have finished with the poll, uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening. And uh, we hope you'll join us for the next webinar in the series. Thanks again to uh, Andre and Nalanjana. Really appreciate thank your time. Thanks, Nalanjana. I'm glad to see you. Greetings from Jakarta. All the best. Yeah, thank you. Stay healthy. Thank Bye. you. You too. Thank you. To everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. 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 Okay, super. Thanks again to everyone.